Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. Y para mis amigos de habla español, hola, y bienvenidos a Lunas de Arquitectura de Software. My name is Mark Richards, and someday, when my Spanish vocabulary increases a little bit, I'll try to do an entire lesson in Spanish, but for the meantime, uh, we'll stick to English, I think. <laughs> Anyways, uh, welcome. This is lesson 134, answering quite a few questions about services, including what is a service? And I'll show you some other questions we'll be answering as well. Um, you can get a full list of all of my lessons on my website at developer2architect.com slash lessons. And here you can watch the lessons from my website or watch them in YouTube. As a matter of fact, most of my lessons uh, come from material from two books I wrote with Neil Ford, uh, The Fundamentals of Software Architecture and also Software Architecture, uh, The Hard Parts. We're going to ask a couple of questions related to really what is a service, but two in particular uh, that I did actually get recently uh, was this. Can you tell me what the difference is between a service and a microservice? I've been at a lot of client sites. As a matter of fact, I would say mm, mostly all of my client sites uh, that interchangeably use these two words. Is there a difference between them? And then another follow-on question, which we'll investigate, which I really love the answer to. And that is, uh, what are the various services called in each kind of distributed architecture? Now, what I'm going to do is show you that services do differentiate based on the kind of architectural style we use. And I want to show you those characteristics. Now, if you look at the kind of the definition of a service, it's a separately deployed unit of software that performs some sort of business or maybe even an infrastructure function. For example, here's a ticketing service that you can use to, let's say, on a problem ticket system uh, to be able to create, cancel, route tickets, assign tickets. It's an example of a service. Uh, so is this one with ticket maintenance. As a matter of fact, this one that just does ticket routing is another example of a service. Notice here that we vary a lot with the granularity when we just talk about a service. Uh, but let's define a microservice and see how it differs. And then we'll look at characteristics of other kinds of services in different distributed architectures. Because a microservice is really defined as a single purpose function deployed as a separate unit of software that owns its own data in a bounded context. For example, maybe just ticket creation alone, a single purpose function is deployed as a separate unit along with its data, its tables, for example. Uh, maybe ticket search is another good example of something that's single purpose. As a matter of fact, ticket assignment might also even be single purpose, although it combines routing. This just shows that multiple components can still exist in a microservice. So we still have the problem with service granularity, but generally the services are fairly fine grained. As a matter of fact, I want to get on to a question I'm more excited about, and that is, does it matter what kind of service exists in all these different kinds of distributed architectures. And as a matter of fact, there is a different name for a service and different characteristics for all of these architecture styles. And it's fairly important to understand what those service characteristics are in each of these architectures. Now let's start with one we just saw, microservices architecture. Services here are in fact called a microservice. And overall, the characteristics of these services are that they are single purpose functions, which means mostly uh, they're usually fine grained. As a matter of fact, that's where the word micro in microservice actually gets its name. It's not about the physical size of the service, but rather what it does. Single purpose function. Also, uh, they usually own their own data in a bounded context. This is very typical and traditional in a microservice. Uh, now, there are times when we do share data between a couple of services in what's called a data domain, uh, but generally each service owns its own data that's different than other architecture styles. And finally, because of that fine-grained nature 
of a microservice. Uh, there is frequent communication typically between services in this architecture style. Well, let's take a look at another architecture style, service-based architecture. Here, the formal name of a service is called a domain service. Uh, generally with service-based architecture, which is a hybrid of microservices, we have coarse-grained services uh, that all share the same data. Um, numbers are in around between maybe four and 12, as opposed to microservices, which is hundreds to thousands. But here, the characteristics of these services are that they are usually coarse-grained and because of that, each of the services contain most of that specific domain functionality. For example, maybe it's order processing, maybe it's payment processing, maybe it's customer processing. Those would all be coarse grain domain services. Now, because of the coarse grain nature of these services and the fact that all of the domain logic is consolidated in one service, generally we don't have much inter-service communication in service-based architecture. So these services are, for the most part, fairly um, self-contained. Um, but also, the other attribute or characteristic of these kind of services is that they do share data with other domain services. There's two other architecture styles I want to show you. Event-driven architecture. Here, the formal name of quote services and event-driven architecture is called an event processor. Now, most of the event-driven architecture engagements and assignments I'm on as a consultant, uh, the teams use the word service, but formally it really is called an event processor. And these services have different characteristics than other services in other types of architecture styles. First of all, the interesting thing about event-driven architecture or event processors is that the granularity can vary greatly. It can, in fact, be a single purpose function, um, but it can also be a major subsystem. Uh, that's the range of granularity that we find. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that <clears throat> these specific event processors usually respond to events, but in turn then trigger other events. And so an event processor can be an event trigger or respond to an event at the same time. Now, communication between different event processors here is typically asynchronous. And so most of these event processors, if not all of them an event-driven architecture, are dealing with notification services or let's say uh, brokers or uh, topics, those sort of things. And also uh, data with these event processors is generally orthogonal to that particular service. And what I mean by that is there's no restriction that has to own its own data. It could share data like service-based or a particular event processor can own its own data just like microservices. Well, there is one other architecture style in the distributed family, and that is space-based architecture. Here, uh, space-based is a very complex architecture style, um, but really gets its name from a computer science term called tuple space. And essentially, in space-based architecture, each of the services that we write is formally called a processing unit. These have very unique characteristics from other architecture styles. Um, first of all, uh, like event-driven architecture, the granularity can vary greatly. A lot of times these processing units can contain the entire application, or it can contain a single purpose function. Uh, again, that's the varying level of granularity here. So there's nothing on these kind of services that restrict it in terms of what it does. Um, but also another unique characteristic here is that these processing units, quote services, um, contain an in-memory data grid, usually using something like replicated caching oh, with tools like Hazelcast or Ignite or Gemfire, Coherence and Finispan, uh, these sort of tools. Um, the communication uh, with the database is primarily through asynchronous data pumps. In other words, one of the unique aspects here is that these services, formerly called processing units, do not directly interact with the database. They do so through those data pumps. Also, 
Uh, the last interesting characteristic here is with space-based architecture, uh, there's frequent service spin-up and tear-down. Uh, this architecture style is all about elasticity. Uh, when load increases, uh, processing units are spun up immediately to handle uh, that increase in load. But when that load decreases, uh, the processing units then, t then get torn down. And this is a unique characteristic because we don't want to have a lot of resource allocation uh, with each of these processing units. So isn't it interesting? We can kind of see that we call all of these things services, but in fact, that very valid question, um, are there different names of services in different architecture styles and do they differ? Uh, the answer is yes. And it's really helpful to see uh, these differences in when we quant kind of call a generic service. And so I hope that this lesson really kind of um, helps you qualify when we start throwing around the word service, uh, that each kind of architecture style has those different characteristics. And by qualifying those, um, it's really helpful to understand um, how to actually implement those services and what some of the constraints are. So this has been Lesson 134, What is a Service? And in any case, thank you so much for listening. Uh, stay tuned in two more weeks for another lesson in Software Architecture Monday. Adios.